We've been talking about the shape of God. So let's turn now to Exodus chapter three, which is oh, such an interesting, such a powerful picture of the mystery of, well, you might say a two way discovery, God and Moses meeting, encountering and changing. In fact, that's what always happens when there's an encounter, even between human beings, isn't there? Whenever there's a connection, there is a transformation. Whenever there is a conversation, then when words are passed, then there's a change. There's a change. Conversation creates change or it creates the possibility of change. So let's uh, turn to that now. The bush that burned. I'm sure you know the bit that I'm talking about right away and thinking about not just the shape of God, but the shape of humanity within that. Of course, we all know that the picture that you have of God relates to you yourself. You know, if you're an angry person, sorry, <laughs> then you tend to project an angry God. If you're a kind person, you tend to project a kind God. But that's a rather facile way of thinking about it. What I'm interested in here is the transformation, the change, because God walks with us in our moments, in our history, in our story. And in that walk, in that journey, we're changed. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the way. And he said, come, follow me. It's all very mobile, isn't it? Very, very much of a journey, very much of a journey rather than a destination, rather than an arrival point. And here in Exodus 3, we encounter not just the changing shape of God or our understanding changing, but the changing shape of humanity in response to that revelation. Praise God. So, Lord, as we come to this, we pray that we may hear your voice and be ready to enter conversation and change ourselves. Amen. Okay. Amen. Well, Moses calls himself an alien residing in a foreign land in Exodus chapter 2, 22. But do you know, in a sense, he's never really been at home. He's raised by a Hebrew mother, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter in chapter two, and given an Egyptian name. And all of that happens in the first couple of chapters of Exodus. And then he tries to help his kinsfolk, the Hebrews, and in the process of that, murders an Egyptian, an Egyptian and is rejected by his own and has to flee Egypt and all the mess that he's created there, only to be identified as an Egyptian by the women that he meets at the well in Midian in chapter two, verse 19. So this is very early in the story. So who, who is this guy? <laughs> so from the adopted son of royalty, he's now shepherding flocks, which is a less than prestigious job and working for his new father-in-law. And that's where things change. So he's an alien in a foreign land. He's been dislocated. He is rootless. He doesn't have any self, any sense of home. And that's very, very important. It often seems to me to be the case that we meet God when our normal way of behaving is somehow broken, when the carpet seems pulled from under us. At a moment of brokenness, we, we are ready to listen. It often happens that way. So there's Moses. There's the first character in the conversation, you might say. And God, God speaks to him. Take the shoes off your feet. The bush is burning. Moses goes over to see this strange sight. He hears a voice. He responds. And God explains himself as being on a rescue mission. And God comes down. That's the verb phrase that they use in chapter three, verse eight. When we say that God meets us where we are, the implication is not that we're always where we should be, but that God adapts and accommodates us nevertheless. Amen. God comes on 
our terms. That's what the incarnation means. God with us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. This is God coming among us. Now, Moses is not necessarily where he should be either. He's on the run for murder. But the sight of the burning bush and God's call will bring him out of obscurity and isolation. He's going to be rescued yet again, and he's going to send him and his family back to Egypt as leaders. That's the call. That's the call. But even for God, the task of getting Moses back on track is not a simple matter. And this is a, a typical commissioning scene. There's lots of commissioning scenes in, in the Bible. And it involves the prophet's objection to God's commission. And the objection highlights the prophet's dependence upon God in undertaking this really important work, this holy work, and reveals an appropriate sense of humility. But Moses is not typical in any sense. Instead of just the one objection, no, Lord, I am but a youth. You know, say, I am just the son of a herdsman. Oh, no, you know, who am I that you should put such grace upon me? You know, you can think of those occasions in the Old Testament. But Moses doesn't just raise one objection. He raises four <laughs> before he says flat out, chapter four, verse 13. He says, no, send somebody else. <laughs> just, I don't want to have anything to do with this rescue mission. No, not me. And so ultimately, he doesn't give a reason. He just gives a refusal. Wow. So that is Moses's rather underwhelming response to God's connection. And it's interesting to note, and this is where we get to the point, that his first objection, which questions his own identity, also connects with God's identity. Do you see how important that is? Because the way I think about myself is connected with the way I think about God. So he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? That's not just humility. That is a quest for identity. Moses is reluctant to take on the role that God asks for him. Now, if you just saw this in terms of being a careers advisor <laughs> you might say well who better than you Moses who better than you who better than you that knows the ways of the Hebrews and knows the way of Egyptian royalty who speaks both languages who better than you you could think of Paul being in the same way like a citizen of two worlds thoroughly competent about dealing with aristocratic Jews Roman officials the Greek language and Palestinian peasants, just absolutely confident moving between the different worlds. And Moses is the same. And his dual identity makes him the perfect person to confront Pharaoh for the sake of the, of the Hebrews, the Hebrew people. And what's more, despite his reluctance and his own earlier misguided interventions he's driven by a sense of justice right he wants to see things better he wants to intervene for the sake of the victimized and the mistreated whenever he sees injustice take place he's emotionally the right person to do this job but the main thing here is the connection with the first point he has no real family until god calls him he is an alien in a strange land and he's being summoned back home go back and tell them what god has done for you and so after turning from the question of his own identity he turns to the question of god's identity who shall i say sent me what's his name what shall i say to them that's the the question that he ponders in, in verse 13. And God replies, I am who I am. When I say God, the Hebrew word is Elohim. So they use Elohim and then they switch to this word Yahweh as if it's God's personal name. 
But the grammatical background of that name is notoriously slippy and subject to any number of translations, including I will be who I will be or I will be who I choose to be. But basically, it's part of the present is part of the present tense of the verb to be. I am who I am. I am. So Moffat in the I think about the 1920s, he translated it the eternal one. You see, he's he's thinking about time and is saying God is not past, he is not present, he is not future, he is the eternal now. I am who I am. So Moffat suggested the eternal one, Yahweh, the eternal one. It also means God's presence is eternal. It means his purpose is eternal and and, and right now. It means his compassion is eternal. It's not wrapped up in a historical circumstance. It is now. And this is Jewish theology, and it's wonderful. And it's that God moves with us in history. And as he does so, our understanding of him changes and his self-revelation develops. Even to the point of Jesus saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you, he is developing. He is clarifying. It's always been there. He is yesterday, today and forever. Jesus Christ, the same God, the eternal one. But we're not just catching up with a historical figure. We are moving in our history through the one who is I am, the God who is with us. Wow. Now, on the one hand, the deity is reserving the right to identify God's self on God's own terms. You could say it means I can be whatever I want. I can be. I'm all things. And on the other hand, the name indicates that God is known through God's actions for others. I've heard their cry. I've come down to rescue them. I'm going to work through you. I am with you. Let's go. <laughs> so I am called into the, the love of God. I've ca I'm called to express it, to share it, to offer it. And I'm to do that, I have to relocate my own identity within the identity of God, the God who comes, the God who calls, the God who acts on our behalf. And this is no different at all from the call of Christ to say, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Come, follow me. Come and die. Come, take up your cross. And you have the mind of Christ. Think my way. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's all of a piece. And Moses is being told the same thing. He said, get on board, Moses, because I'm doing it and I'm doing it through you. But you, your identity is going to be wrapped up in me and my identity is going to be wrapped up in you. I'm going to honor you with my presence. Wow. And this is the promise to us in this and every prophetic commissioning scene. God's work is aligned and intertwined with human agency. Moses saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew and Pharaoh's daughter saw the child and heard him crying. And God has seen the misery of his people and heard their cries. And he's been moved to action. And such seeing and knowing and acting for others is part of the very identity of God. And as I respond to his call, I begin to notice, I begin to think the thoughts of Christ and to act that way. And much as Moses' identity emerges from his own past, so God's actions in the present emerge from his own commitment to the ancestors, the God of Exodus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But unlike human commitments that might waver and fade, God's identity is constant, and God will be known in God's future faithfulness to Moses and the people. I am who I am, and I will be with you, God promises. Let's pray. 
Lord, we pray that we may hear your voice. We pray that we may answer your call. We pray that we may see your face and know your heart and step up and step out to be with you. Lord, I pray that I might understand you more, see you more and live this way. In the name of Jesus, through the model of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. My dear Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you in this wonderful, wonderful word.